This is the first video in a series of videos about the molecules of life, really the molecules that you find in all living things that keep those living things alive. There are two types of compounds important to life, organic compounds and inorganic compounds. We'll focus mostly on the organic compounds, but there is one really important inorganic compound that we need to also talk about, and that is water. And that's the focus of this video. Have you ever noticed how water beads up on a just waxed car or on waxy surfaces like the surface of these leaves? It's almost as though there's a net thrown over the water and it's holding it into place, almost defying gravity in some spots. What causes that? Well, it has to do with the nature of water. The water molecule is polar and what that means is that the oxygen atom, which is by far the larger atom, is more electronegative. That is, um, it actually has such a big nucleus that it holds not only its own electrons close to it, but it also tends to pull the hydrogen electrons closer to it most of the time. So as a result, it has a slightly negative charge on it. Because the electrons of hydrogen are spending a little bit more time closer to oxygen than hydrogen, that makes each of these hydrogen atoms slightly positive. Because there is a slight positive charge on the hydrogens and a slight negative charge on the oxygen, we say that the water molecule is polar. You can see that there are eight protons in the nucleus of an oxygen atom and eight neutrons, whereas a hydrogen atom only has one proton and maybe one, two, or three neutrons. So they don't have as much of a pulling power to keep their own electrons close to them. This is also showing us that the bonds between the hydrogens and the oxygens are the result of shared electrons, which means that these are covalent bonds, which are very strong bonds. Polarity results in hydrogen bonding between molecules. A positively charged hydrogen atom in one water molecule will be attracted to a negatively charged oxygen atom of another molecule, resulting in a hydrogen bond and you can see that there's another hydrogen bond over here. So we have two water molecules and we also have two hydrogen bonds. Multiply that by a whole bunch of water molecules and there are an awful lot of hydrogen bonds. Now these are not very strong bonds but they are strong enough to form that net that we talked about that's sort of holding that bubble of water together almost defying gravity and in this graphic you can see a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds between water molecules. Because of this polarity of water molecules and the hydrogen bonding that takes place water has some pretty extraordinary properties and we're going to talk about those properties in this video. They include surface tension, capillary action due to cohesion and adhesion, high heat of vaporization, resistance to temperature change, solid ice being less dense than liquid water, and water being a universal solvent. Let's take a look at surface tension first. Surface tension is just a measure of the resistance of stretching or breaking of the surface of a liquid such as water. And in water it results from hydrogen bonding. This is relevant uh, to life, not just because uh, it's entertaining for us to be able to float a paper clip on the surface of the water without breaking those hydrogen bonds, but there are animals like insects that can actually walk around on the surface of the water as well as a result of these hydrogen bonds. We also see capillary action. Capillary action is the result of cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is the sticking together of water molecules due to hydrogen bonding between the adjacent water molecules and adhesion is the sticking of water molecules to other substances. So we can see kind of a close-up here that shows us capillary action in very thin tubes and the liquid on the left is water the liquid on the right is mercury and you can see that because the water molecules are sticking to each other and because they're sticking to the actual container that they're placed in they actually can almost climb up the column shown here and the more narrow the column the higher up those water molecules can go. Now other liquids that don't have hydrogen bonding that causes the molecules to actually stick to each other and be attracted to other surfaces like the sides of the container, they won't do that. And so mercury would not show uh, capillarity in this way. The relevance to life is that whether we're talking about a small 
uh, piece of grass or a very tall tree, those water molecules actually form a column up through the xylem. And because they're sticking to each other and they're sticking to the inside of the xylem, they basically can move up the tra up up the plant. Now, in a short piece of grass, that's all it takes. You get a little bit of root pressure. It forces a few of these up, and because they're all sort of linked together like box cars on a train, as one moves up, the others behind it move along. In a big tree like this, you also need to sort of uh, bank on transpiration. And as the trees open up their leaves to let carbon dioxide gas in to do photosynthesis, some of the water escapes. But because all of these water molecules are traveling in thin tubes right up the surface of the tree, and because they're all linked to one another, if one of them actually leaves, then the others kind of get pulled up in this chain, and it helps to draw the water right up through the tree and deliver water to all the various cells throughout the whole plant. Water also has a high heat of vaporization. And what that means is that you actually have to put a fair amount of energy into the water to get it to change phases, to go from being a liquid to a gas, for example. So if we take a look at this graph, here's zero degrees, which would be freezing, and here's 100 degrees, which would be the boiling point of water. And the normal range of ocean temperatures is somewhere between zero and 30 degrees Celsius. You can see that at zero degrees Celsius, the phase change takes quite a while. In other words, to get something to change from a solid to a liquid, it actually takes a fair amount of energy. But to get something to change from a liquid to a gas, water really resists changing from a liquid to a gas. And this is a benefit to living things because if you're a little creature that's caught in the tide pool waiting for the tide to come back in, you don't want your water to all evaporate by the time the tide comes back in because that would kill you. It creates a very stable environment for the life. The other thing that it does is it prevents rapid changes in temperature. So the water temperature will not rise quickly, it will not fall quickly. And You probably notice this when you're at the beach in the evening, you touch the water, it feels warm and that's because it's had all day to absorb a lot of heat energy from the sun and it's retaining that. It's not letting that heat energy go. Similarly in the morning when it's had all night to cool, you probably notice that the water feels pretty cold and if you go for a morning swim in a lake or in the ocean, you'll notice that the water is quite cold and it takes a, a good chunk of the day for it to start heating up again. This resistance to temperature change is a really good thing for living things because it means there are no rapid swings of temperature and the range of temperatures does not change radically within the same season and even from season to season as it goes from summer to fall to winter, the change in temperature is very, very gradual. Another interesting thing that happens when water changes temperature is that freezing occurs. What is unusual about water is that due to hydrogen bonding, the liquid form of the molecules are actually more densely packed than the solid form. What that translates into is that ice is less dense than liquid water and the result of that is that ice floats and the benefit for living things is that they basically have a nice insulator on top of the lake or the pond that they live in or even the ocean and it helps to keep the water temperature underneath although cold, quite stable. The other thing that's a benefit is that lakes and ponds freeze from the top down instead of the bottom up and because they freeze from the top down uh, basically the freezing will stop because the temperature of the water underneath will be stable as soon as you have that layer of insulating ice on top. On the other hand if you had a pond that froze from the bottom up eventually what you would have is a solid block of ice and probably some very unhappy and dead animals. Water is also a universal solvent. Because water is polar, it actually has a lot of versatility as a solvent. In this diagram, you can see that the sodium chloride, made up of sodium ions and chloride ions, is actually going to respond to the fact that the water is also polar where we have these large negatively charged oxygen atoms and we have um, positively charged or slightly positively charged hydrogen ions. Uh, what that means is that the oxygens which are negative uh, are going to be attracted to the positive sodiums 
and that means that the hydrogens which are positive are going to be attracted to the negative uh, chloride ions and what that effectively does is it pulls apart sort of the crystal lattice of sodium chloride in solid form and allows it to dissolve very easily in water. This is the case with a lot of substances which means that water is actually a really good solvent and, and that's important because the compounds necessary for life have to be able to dissolve in the water if they're actually going to be able to react with one another. Let's do a reality check. See if you can match the property of water with its significance for life. Pause the video now and take a look and see how these match up. Check your answers. How did you do? One more question. Why does the polarity of water molecules cause hydrogen bonding between them? Something to think about.